Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus went out and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen and hear the parable of the sower. The Gospel of the Lord. O Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and hands and use them for your love's sake. Amen. About now is the time I started thinking about in early spring. It's the time when what has been planted finally comes to fruition. It's the time when tomato plants are heavy with fruit. It's the time when sweet corn is available and abundant. It's the time when peaches and blueberries and strawberries are plump and ripe. Our farmer's market has just about everything that is fresh and just about everything else that can be made with what is fresh. I could go broke there each week. On my day off last week, I journeyed over to the farm where my grandparents once lived. My grandfather was a part-time farmer, and his, in, in his retirement, a massive vegetable gardener. 
There are still vestiges of grapevines and fruit trees and a huge open space where row after row was tilled and planted and weeded carefully every season. The old house there has a basement kitchen that was set up just for canning and freezing. Only that. These were people of the land and children of the Depression. I guess I come by my obsession with all things grown naturally. I've started off with a modest container garden in our newer home, but that will not be enough. There is nothing like picking a ripe cherry tomato off the vine and popping it in your mouth for an instant snack. And yes, I'm that guy who asks all the farmers for dented and overripe tomatoes so I can make and jar sauce with my specially designed tomato squeezer machine. As a person of faith, the matters and mechanics of growing things is a lively part of my consciousness. Paying attention to the rhythms of the natural world helps make sense of life and its vicissitudes. Seasons and soil, seeds and sowers fuel my understanding of how God works, even in the midst of high-minded ideals of mission and ministry and theology. And even today's Midsummer Gospel arrives in a moment where it is so likely to capture this seasonal moment, at least in our mind's eye. Jesus uses gardening parables over and over to speak about and to his mostly agrarian followers. The parable of the sower is an old chestnut, and it tells of a sower that spreads seeds liberally. Some fall on a path, some fall on rocky ground, some fall among thorns, and finally some fall on good soil. The common interpretation might be for us to shape up and get right so that the word of God, which is the seed, will bear fruit in us. And we must root out being shallow or rocky or thorny, though we can always be shallow and rocky and thorny. But that only takes us so far. And to my agricultural sensibilities, misses the point. The parable is not about us. It's about God. Sometimes we get focused so focused on us that we get lost in that process. What Jesus tells us and what we need to hear is that God is lavish and abundant and creative and prodigious. The word of God is flung all over, not just where it will bear fruit and not where it will always bear the most fruit. The way of God and the nature of God and the promise of God is that God can always use our participation, but God does not depend on our goodness or perfection. Consider where the story begins. Jesus is surrounded by a crowd, so much so that he has to get into a boat and speak to them as they stand on the beach. This is in Galilee on a big lake. It is a minor little place where people make their way fishing and foraging and farming. These are not the educated elites. These are mostly illiterate people They are under the thumb of Roman occupation. They are unarmed, heavily taxed, and always being kept in their place. If the spread of the gospel depended on them, their abilities, and their resources, we wouldn't have much of a story to tell. But as we know, the word spread from person to person and community to community, and that is a sign of God's provision, not humanity's innate cleverness. And that's the point. With wild generosity, God will take whatever there is and grow it. As the 20th century preacher Vance Havner reminds us, God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop, broken clouds to give rain, broken grains to give bread, and broken bread to give strength. There's a lot of broken in our world now as ever, with so much canceled, on hold, or uncertain, We're having a hard time gauging and marking time, and sometimes it makes us a little uneasy. Now's the time I usually get excited for college football to start. Now's the time when I'm used to seeing extended families going on a vacation or adventure somewhere new. Now's the time when kids are supposed to be at camp and schools are beginning to prepare for the upcoming school year, and our parish should be preparing for our annual Shrinemont retreat. There's grief in not being able to look forward with any expectation or certainty. 
It's good to claim that, even if it's hard. But, and this is a substantial but, God's abundance is not on hold. God's love is still as prodigal and prolific as ever. We may have to focus on simpler and smaller things, lower our horizon. We may have to shorten the horizon to look forward in anticipating new life. We may have to pray with more silence. We may have to seek a little deeper, and we may have to listen a little longer for the voice of creation moving in us. If all else fails, eat a ripe peach. Slice a bright red watermelon. Smell the freshly mown grass and listen to the birds coming alive each morning. The grower, the sower, the creator is alive and well. And this is not whistling in the dark. It's choosing to find light, even if it has to shine through the cracks of some brokenness. I found great solace this week in reading some poetry, particularly Mary Oliver's poetry. Her way with words is yet another sign of God's creative power. In particular, I was drawn to her poem, I Worried. I wonder why. And I close with these, her holy words. I worried. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it, and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading or am I just imagining it? Imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. Amen.